Thank you for downloading the latest episode of Positively Trek. We could not do this podcast without the support of our Patreon supporters, including Carl Morris, Joyce Marin, and Jim Stoffel. If you'd like to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash positively trek. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shoutouts, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you so much for your support. And with that, let's get on with the show. The dog. See the dog. I sound it out. Run. That's it, Uhura. That's very good. Now, try the next one. The dog has a... The dog... Mm, see kombuka. Eh? Mm, not, not Swahili, Uhura. In English, the dog has a ball. See? B -a -o. Ball. 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 Now you go ahead. Hey, my goofy. The dog has a ball. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> This book that we're going to review today, I actually remember what I think about it. Well, one reason is because I just read it. And the second reason is because I haven't had some kind of thing named Nomad wiping my memory away, like in the Changeling in the original series. So I can remember this. Well, that's lucky because uh, that happens to me like three or four times a year. So... I'm really glad you'll be able to be able to remember this. I thankfully it hasn't happened lately, so I should be good for this. I should be good too. And uh, wait, wait, I don't remember what you just said. Did we start the show? I don't remember. Recording. We, wait, no, we did that. Wait, we, um, are we recording? Or something we, like that. I don't know. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. This is positively Trek. I remember that. And you're Dan Gunther. That's correct. And you're. Jim. Your name is Jim. No, wait, that's, oh, that's from a movie I like. Darn it. I don't know. Spot. Bruce. Bruce. It's Bruce. Bruce. Yes, hey, Bruce. Yes. Bruce Gibson. Yes. Here we are. Hey, we're going to talk about a novel here in our book club, and it's a very new novel, just came out recently, called Living Memory. It's a TOS novel by Christopher L. Bennett, and we're going to dive right into it. So, hey, just be aware that we're going to hit some spoilers in here. So if you haven't read it and you just want a little hint of maybe what's going on, maybe listen to the, you know, a little bit of the beginning here, but then you probably want to tune out. So let's dive right into it. So Dan, we were talking right before the show and you said that you really liked this novel. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I, I was, I generally like Christopher L. Bennett's novels. They're a lot of fun, especially for like a, continuity hound like me connecting all the little disparate bits of star trek history and stuff and you know i i really like the way he writes characters and the way he writes big huge grand stories and little intimate character stuff too so yeah this one is right up my alley i really enjoyed this one i really enjoyed it too the thing about christopher l bennett is i feel like he's a walking star trek encyclopedia and now i think <laughs> most of the authors are but I mean, really, and I, I don't know, maybe he's got a cheat sheet somewhere, but I feel so many times like I see him in Trek BBS or elsewhere and he'll say, oh, this event happened in DC Comics Star Trek number 22. Like, how does he remember that? Oh, it's crazy. And that was one of the things that I put in the notes here is the sheer amount of research that he does for his novels. There are 10 pages of acknowledgments in this book. Well, I, I say 10 pages. I read the ebook, so it's probably fewer pages than that. But still, in the ebook format I read, the font size I read, it came out to 10 pages. And I read them all because... It's a fascinating insight into like all these little pieces that he pulls from all over the Star Trek universe and makes it work. You know, some stuff he says, yeah, this went a different direction. I did a different thing, but 
he still acknowledges all of that work of other authors over the course of the 50 plus years of Star Trek. It's great. I love it. Well, I was also on his website. So if you Google search for Christopher L. Bennett and go to his site, he has the annotations for all the different chapters in there up already. Sometimes he doesn't have that up till weeks or months after the book comes out. But as we record, the book's only been out for a week and he already has that on his website. And I love just reading through all the little bits and pieces of like where certain things came from, like from DC Comics, Star Trek number 22 or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. And and it's always just so meticulous. Like he's not going to flub something because it's clear he double checks everything and makes sure he gets it right. That's awesome. Well, at least I assume he got it right. I mean, he, he could get it wrong. I might not know it. <laughs> I'd know it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I knew you would. (laughs) For sure. Well, let's talk about one of the things in this book about what what is the crisis? What is the thing that's going on here? And there's these flares in space. It's these little pockets of bright flashes of light that are occurring. And we have this ship that is in the Altair system that has some cadets that are getting ready to start in Starfleet Academy. They're on their little pre- school adventure before they start school and these little lights start to appear and in you know start to affect the ship and kills the pilot and they're just flashing and stuff and it's like what what are these things and then we see the reliant coming to investigate and who who is on the reliant well it's Chekhov, but who's the captain of the reliant terrell I was so glad because we don't get enough of Captain Terrell and Chekhov adventures. Agreed. I loved the fact that the Reliant was in this novel and, you know, featured on the cover. Really nice to see the ship there. And we honestly got more of the Reliant in this story than I was expecting. And I was really happy to see that. So, yeah, we've got Captain Terrell and Chekhov, who's interestingly not the first officer yet, just the science officer. I shouldn't say just the science officer. That's a very important role. But, you know, it was interesting to see this period of time before Star Trek II. And, of course, we know the kind of horrible end that this ship is going to come to. But so it's really nice to see that ship and its crew kind of divorced from that and as a happy time as part of the fleet i guess you know just doing their duty not wrapped up in the whole con story so that was really cool yeah i thought the same thing that it was just nice to see that not you know what they went through with con that they're just out on their mission i found it interesting that he was a science officer not the first officer because in other books that have been published There's a few out there where Chekhov leaves to go become first officer of the Reliant. And Mm. here this book starts him off as, nope, he's not a first officer. He's the science officer. And there's another, uh, there is a first officer, Commander Rem Azem Oz, and he's a Rillian. Uh, He's got his wings and everything. And, And Kyle is there. Lieutenant John Kyle is there as communications officer, like we saw in The Wrath of Khan. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I liked seeing that crew. Would have liked to have seen them a little bit more in this dynamic a little bit. We learn a little bit about the first officer, but not a lot, but still kind of cool to see them all interacting here. I do love that Chekhov is the science officer, though, because of all the training he did under Spock. And whenever Spock wasn't on the bridge, he was always the one at Spock station looking into his little viewer and stuff. So I thought that was nice. It makes a lot more sense than his security officer role. I agree 112% with that. Ooh, very scientific, <laughs> precise measurement of agreement. Chekhov would be proud. Yes, it's <laughs> logical. So they're seeing these vacuum fluctuations that are forming quantum wormholes, these flares that begin to show up. And, and not only there, but we start to discover that they're showing up in other systems in our galaxy and at one point, Denoblia gets these flares in its planet. Usually they're happening out in space. And usually nobody gets killed unless there's a ship nearby. But this time it actually happens on a planet, killing people and just bursting out of the planet. And everybody's kind of wondering, like, what is the cause of these things? Because Chekhov says, like, this is, this is a one-time thing. Like, this is a very rare thing that's probably not going to happen again. But then they start to find out it's happening over and over and over again. Is this something done on purpose by someone? 
what is causing this? Are, are they being attacked? And why is it just an open space and a one time on a planet? I really enjoyed this scientific mystery. This was something that kept me flipping through the book and moving through and wanting to know what's going on here. Why is, why are these happening? You know, it's, it's a little bit of a, I guess red herring isn't the, the right term, but it's, it's the, it's the thing that drives the plot forward, the kind of techno babbly thing, but it definitely drew me along. I was really fascinated by this weird mystery and everyone seems pretty flummoxed by what could be causing it. Well, here's the thing. Okay. Again, we're going to get into spoiler territory here because I want to focus on the flares in space. So they start to figure out that all these different locations that these flares are flaring up are places that the Enterprise has visited. Now, at first when I heard that, I thought, okay, well, you know, other ships have probably visited these areas. But I guess as they're researching and tracking, they start to realize the Enterprise has been to all these places but not just that they've been there, but in the same order as the flares, but in reverse. Yeah, and I thought that was fun, like putting, putting the pieces together and figuring it out and narrowing it down. So at first I was like, okay, you know, who are the powerful things that the Enterprise has encountered? Could it be Trelane? Could it be, I don't know, Sargon's people? Could it be... Like, who knows, right? The lights of Zatar. I don't know. <laughs> like, what could it be? But uh, I, I like how they employ the scientific method and just keep narrowing the focus and eliminating variables until they figure out exactly what the correlation is. Because I kept wondering, what is it? Like, what is causing these things that would do this at locations the Enterprise has visited in the same order, but in reverse? the sequential order of the places they've been to. And it's been like 12 years or so since they were at these locations. So why now? What are, whoever's doing this, what are they trying to accomplish? Or is it something that the ship caused itself and this is like a delayed reaction? But again, why in reverse order? You mm -hmm. wouldn't think it would work in that manner. So I really was scratching my head wondering what the connection was here. Yeah. And it's not just in reverse order too. It was, you know, like the enterprise visited this planet and then maybe visited the next planet like two months later, but this is like a few days later it moves right. to this one. And then a few days later, this one. So it's not even like tied to when the enterprise was there. It was just purely the order of them going there. So yeah, like I was, I was thinking the same, like something in the engines, like what, what, what's happening? Is it an environmental thing? Like what is happening here? And it was happening in the precise locations that the enterprise has visited, but not necessarily, not necessarily on the planet they visited. So if they visited a planet, that planet is rotating around its sun. It's not in the mm -hmm. exact same location, but the flares are happening in the location that the planet was in when the enterprise went to visit. And exactly, that's when I started yeah. to realize, I don't think this is purposeful, but more like, yeah, like, are the ship engines, did it do something like a rip in space or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But they're, we, they, they, they investigated this further, and Yuhura is the one that is the common denominator here. It's places that she has been, and I thought that was interesting, too, because there was always locations that she visited, that she beamed down to. It wasn't just where the Enterprise went, but she actually went to visit those planets. And specifically, she beamed down to and was unaccounted for for some period of time with her whereabouts and her actions unknown, which, you know, isn't necessarily, as they point out, suspicious in and of itself, but it just that's the correlation. That's the common denominator on all of these planets. So I, I love the scene where Uhura is in her quarters and she decides to try and look at the patterns musically and try and figure out a pattern that way. And then her eyes go wide and she thinks, am I going crazy? Is this for real? And we don't find out what she noticed right then and there. It, it takes a couple chapters. That was a little frustrating, but I love that scene where she's like, wait, what is going on here? Which of course made me immediately want to flip to the next chapter and keep reading. It sounds like you just kept reading and reading, Dan. I did. Uh, so yesterday morning before uh, we 
the day before we're recording this, I was at 36% done. I read the entire rest of the book yesterday. (laughs) Good for you. I like that. I was reading this. I, I started, I think the evening it came out, which was a Tuesday. And I think I read it a little bit on Wednesday. I had to skip Thursday or whatever. I couldn't get to it. I read a lot on Friday and I was about 60 something percent on Friday. And I thought, okay, well, I'll read, you know, some on Saturday and I'll try to finish the rest on Sunday. Nope. I read it all on Saturday. I got mm-hmm. it done that day. It's like, I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. I yeah, just wanted that's, to see what happened. That's the thing. Like I was kind of out of time. I had to read it that day. But it wasn't a chore at all. Like this book just kept me flipping to the next page. It, I was really, it grabbed me. Me too. I like the concept of this book, which we're going to get into. But uh, Uhura is on the Asimov. She's charting subspace density anomalies and stuff, which I think was in the higher frontier that was established, which was a previous book of Christopher L. Bennett's. And uh, Scotty's on the ship with her and it's uh, commanded by Captain Aaron Blake. So we start to learn more that not only is she discovering that she has had this pattern of visiting these locations and was on like a personal leave or was unaccounted for, but she doesn't even remember going to these places. And it's because if you watch the TOS episode, The Changeling, Nomad wipes her memory. And we see her learning and, you know, Christine Chappell's trying to help her learn her job and and try to jigger some of her memories. But what is established here is she can still have feelings from her past that are triggered by certain things, but she doesn't know why she has those feelings and she doesn't really remember anything prior to Nomad. But she's able to still perform her duty that somehow just comes naturally to her. And she decides that she's not going to look back at her past. She's only going to look forward and establish her family, which is the crew of the enterprise. Yeah, this, okay. This always bugged me. And I think a lot of people about that episode, the changeling, because it's treated just as an afterthought. Right. That like, oh, Nomad wiped Uhura's memory. Oh, but we're retraining her. She'll be back up to her usual self in two weeks. She won't regain her memories. They make that very clear in the episode. They say like the Nomad can fix Scotty because it's just a physical issue. But with Uhura, those memories are gone. They're completely gone and erased and never coming back. But like McCoy and Chapel, they're like, oh, yeah, we'll retrain her. She'll be fine in two weeks always just really bugged me because of course, given the nature of television at the time and all that kind of stuff, it's never acknowledged again, never talked about, but that's such a huge traumatic incident, losing your entire past and all your memories of your friends and family and all that kind of stuff. It just, yeah, it bugged me how casually that was treated on the show. And how it's not taken that seriously, like you're mentioning. I, now that you say that, I remember in sickbay, McCoy and and Chapel are just kind of smiling and, oh, look at Uhura trying to learn things again. How cute, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, this is a serious issue. She doesn't remember anything, you know? For the past 20, 30 years of her life, it's gone. She doesn't remember any of it. And yeah. that's, that's a serious, I mean, that's a whole episode right there that you can play off of. Of course, now there's a novel. Absolutely. And that's what I love about Star Trek novels and the added layers that authors can add to these stories because Christopher Bennett kind of does a little bit of rehabilitation here of that story in that he can establish now that, yeah, there is these fast learning Arcturan learning techniques that they used and that McCoy and Chapel encouraged Uhura to reach out to her family, but she decided not to because of these reasons and that sort of thing. So, you know, he kind of is able to, you know, putty over some of the rough edges and sand them down and make it a little bit more believable than what we got in the original series. So I do appreciate that he's able to take that story or that element of the story, which is not great and do something interesting with it and kind of explain a little, a little bit that makes it feel a little better about what we see on screen. You would think that they would tell her to go on leave and send her back to earth 
after that. Which is exactly what Christopher Bennett says they did, but she refused. Yeah. She refused, right. She figured she's out there in deep space and she doesn't want to reconnect. She just wants to move forward. And I think if I were in that situation, I would want to go visit my family. I, mm-hmm. And maybe not. I mean, I don't know. We, we've never had that situation. But to me, I feel that my f- family that I don't remember that knows me probably better than anyone else could really help me learn who I am. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated her reasoning for not doing that, which I found really interesting where she says, you know, she would be going home and asking so much of these strangers that she doesn't know and offering nothing in return, which I think sells herself short. Like her family would want to reconnect with her, obviously. So she's not taking that into account, but I appreciate what she said there and her feelings about it. But I also feel like there's a certain amount of fear in there as well, because it really is a complete unknown, right? You have no idea who these people are and you would feel embarrassed and ashamed and maybe angry, but also very fearful. I think of what that might do, you know, If you have absolutely no idea whatsoever, I could totally see her not wanting to connect. I really think if this were real life, I feel like the chief medical officer of the ship would make it mandatory (laughs) that you go home and, and reconstruct your life. But for the purposes of the story, I think it's an interesting thing that comes out that she has to do that in this novel at this time. And I can also imagine that she doesn't want to cause the hurt and pain to her family, which they would Mm -hmm. already have knowing that she's out there with no memory of them. But then for that person to show up on their doorstep and say, you're strangers to me. You're my mother. You're my father. You're my brother. You're strangers to me. Mm -hmm. And that could be devastating to them. And I guess in a way she looks at it as like, well, that person they know is dead. And so why bring her there if she's not really who she used to be? I can see where it's, it's, it's complicated because you don't know these people and you, you could really bring a lot of hurt and pain to them by showing up and, and just not having any emotional connection to them anymore. Yeah. There's also an element to this that just really spoke to me and it took me a little while. So kind of jumping around the novel here where she does return home and connects with her family a little bit. This part of the novel really spoke to me and just, just, I I couldn't figure out at first exactly why, but as she's reconnecting with her family and there's that resentment on the, on the part of her brother and the fact that she didn't want to, but is now forced to kind of thing. I, I feel like it kind of parallels a situation faced by many people who become disconnected from their culture, their roots a little bit. And for myself, I'm I'm Métis, which is a mix of European and native Canadian heritage. And a lot of times when I visited my family up north, my grandma and, and her family and stuff, having lived apart from them for so long, I felt a little disconnected from them and always like, this is a little bit of an alien culture and I just didn't quite fit in quite right. And recently uh, I've had to, I've, I've had a, a, job where um, I'm finding myself visiting uh, reserves here in in my area, which in the U.S. you would know them as reservations, same kind of idea, and meeting people who in telling me their first language is Cree and not being able to communicate with them, even though my background is Cree. I've never learned Cree. I feel like there's that that weird disconnect that like I just kind of left that culture behind and never went back and connected to it. So I was wondering if there was some sort of that kind of idea informing this part of the story a little bit. And especially the fact that, you know, there's some traditional aspects of African culture of that part of Africa that she's from, that we see play out in the novel a little bit like her stepfather wearing traditional African a dashiki and, and, and the hat and that kind of thing. I was wondering, like, it was just enough of a touchstone that was making me think of cult in cultural terms. And I was wondering if that kind of informed that part of the story a little bit. 
That's interesting to me because the enterprise itself is its own culture, right? It mm-hmm. doesn't represent really a particular culture on earth. So no matter where you're from on earth and no matter your family, if the, all you remember is the ship and the people you've been with on that ship, everything is a foreign culture to your point. So going back would be a culture shock to her, right? Because mm-hmm. she's not, she, she probably doesn't even know how to behave, you know? Yeah. I mean, just visiting another country, you you try to adapt to that culture and you try to read about it or find out more about it to say, well, you know, how do I act? How Where do I go? What? How do I do things? You know, what's acceptable? What's not acceptable? She doesn't know any of that unless she researched ahead of time, but she doesn't even know her family's culture. So I can see like to your your point, like you kind of feel removed from that in your own sense with your own past cultures that you're trying to relate to but it's still kind of foreign to you even though it's Mm -hmm. a part of you yeah absolutely and that kind of embarrassment maybe that like i didn't go back sooner and learn more about that culture and try and integrate it into my life more i i felt that coming from uhura here and maybe that's part of why she never went back home like the embarrassment of that a little bit as well through no fault of her own but at the same time you know, not wanting to impose on yes. the, her family, but, you know, not being a part of it anymore. You know, it, it just, I don't know. It really, something in there really resonated with me. Well, that's awesome. So she does, like you mentioned, go back to her family. And it's been, like I said, I think 12 years since the Nomad incident. She's gone back because she's trying to put the pieces together as to what was it that she could have possibly do been doing when she went to these planets. Was she working on some kind of experiment? Was there something that she doesn't recall that the crew doesn't know when they were when she was doing these personal things? Maybe it's something she told her family. And then it comes across from her brother, and I understand why he would say this, but it's almost like, oh, it's a selfish want. You're not here to reconnect with us necessarily. You're here because this is business. You're trying to figure out something, uh, this mystery to, to take care of these flares in space, and you've waited all this time, and we've had marriages and deaths or whatever, and you've never showed up, and now when you need us, that's when you get here. And it's not completely unfair i mean you know he's emotional and it he's he's been hurt of course and that's coming through but if this hadn't come up would she ever have gone home probably not which is you know that's really sad so you know i i feel like it's it's definitely uh a valid point on his part a little harsh but at the same time like yeah I I can understand why he's so hurt and why he would see this this way. But her mother doesn't react that way. She's Mm -hmm. very welcoming. And I think for her, it's probably, I'm just glad you showed up. I'm just glad at some point you came here. I don't care what the reasoning is because yes, she knows her daughter doesn't have the connection with them. She doesn't remember them. So, you know, they may never see her again, but whatever reason that brought her here, now's an opportunity to maybe connect with her, make her feel welcome, may, make her not feel guilty or, or strange or anything like that. And I, lo- I think this is one of my favorite scenes in the book is just her meeting with her family because now she's yeah. got a stepfather she never really knew before. Because her father had passed away. So not only she does she not know her own family, but there's a new member of the family she never would have known prior yeah. to. Yeah. It's funny you say that, that that was one of your favorite parts of the book. Because I was so enjoying that part of the book. And just so immersed in what was going on in that part of the story. That when she gets the clue from them and then goes on to the next thing, I was kind of really sad because I was like, I want to see more of this reconnection. I want to see where it goes from here, but Oh shoot. Okay. She's got the clue that she needs now. She's got to move on to the next part. And I was, I was actually like, Oh yeah, shoot. I guess the rest of the book won't be about her reconnecting with her family. Of course not. So yeah. It's funny you said that because I felt the same way. And in a lot of ways that kind of knocked the book down a notch for me in my, in my scale of, of ratings, because 
and it's no fault, of course, of the author. I mean, this is a this is a good story, you know, a great novel. But when we got to that part, after that chapter, because it's really just in a chapter that this goes on, I was wishing the novel was more about that. That yeah. at that point, I was like, you know what? This would have been a great novel if it started off with just she's going home for whatever reason. Maybe this is the reason, and it's just a couple chapters or so that's established the reason and then the rest of the book is her at home trying to fit in trying to connect family trying to connect with past friends whatever it is and just see that journey that she has to go through back home Mm -hmm. and i really wanted to see that (laughs) and that's why i was like oh now i want that story instead (laughs) yeah it's kind of almost you know like you said, if it, if it knocked it down a little bit in your estimation, it's really because this part of the story was so (laughs) well-written that that happened, which is kind of too bad. But yeah, I, I, I was so enjoying this part of the story and the kind of naive realization that, oh, the rest of the book won't be this. Darn it. (laughs) Well, I've noticed that most of the Star Trek books, since I've been recording with you both on Literary Treks and Positively Trek, what I've started to pick up is finding more about what I like most about Star Trek novels, what my favorite type of Star Trek novel is, and it's Hmm. the more personal stories. It's like, I I love science fiction, but it's like I almost want science fiction to take a slight background and just focus more on the character and their personal stories. Yeah. That's, and I mean, that to me was one of the genius things about this book to me was because there's this big science fiction mystery going on, but in order to solve it, what has to be done is this personal journey of this character through her past and through her life up to the point where she lost her memory. I love that he was able to craft a story that, you know, had these big science fiction mystery stakes, but was, was hinging on this one character and her having to reconnect with her past. Like, that's so cool. I love that. Yeah. I was surprised going into this novel. I wasn't expecting it to be a horror novel. I wasn't expecting to get, stories of her past or stories about her, you know, I knew she was going to be a big part of the novel, but yeah, I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. So we can gush all we want, but let's move on to some other things here. We have the Warborn and they're from Arcturus four and these, okay. You have to admit they remind you of the clones from star Wars, the clone wars, right? I mean, these are, beings that are being bred that not not originally for war and they're not clones just put that put that out there they're not clones they make that very clear but their ancestors migrated from another planet resulting in them re-engineering their genes to breed and mature rapidly i did think of the clones from star wars later but initially my thought was the jemadar the the soldiers bred for war for that one purpose with a very short lives as well, as they mention. That totally makes sense. Yes. Well, once they, this population grew on this planet and formed nation states, they started to breed more armies, you know, cause now all these nation states are going to fight and so on. But as time went on, you know, those things resolved themselves and now they were just bred to defend their planet because now they're more of a galactic society. And, you know, joining the Federation, which they later did, you know, this type of tactic is forbidden. It's outlawed in the Federation to breed augments, in a sense, uh, for fighting wars. And that practice had been stopped until we get to the war with the Klingons in Star Trek Discovery. Which I thought was nice, a nice way to kind of tie that in and, and put that in a specific part of Star Trek history. I really appreciated that. Me too. But uh, after that Klingon war stopped, they put them in cryogenic stasis. And now you have thousands of these people that are in stasis like this. And then it started to fail. So now what are they going to do with these people? They have, you know, some of them start to die what are you going to do with those that, you know, are, are going to live? So they decide to do this, this pilot program and put them 
a few of them in the academy just to kind of test things out. And at this point, I was like, ooh, this could be really dangerous. If they're bred for war, we're putting them in the academy. I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate the origin of this as well, because this, you know, this species was introduced in Star Trek, the motion picture as like a background species. And the write up for them was something like they're genetically engineered shock troops that are used in Starfleet or something, which is like, well, that doesn't fit with the Federation and Starfleet that we know. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I love that Christopher Bennett was able to kind of use some of that backstory and make it fit better into the Star Trek universe. But yeah, as you just said, this could cause problems and you know, it's this pilot project, like you said, and, and this commander goes to Kirk, this commander Rakathema, who's an Arcturan, not one of these warborn, but just kind of a spokesperson advocating for them, basically saying like, yeah, let's try this out. Let's have a dozen of them join Starfleet Academy as this, as this pilot project. And there's a lot of protests from various quarters and, and, and concerns, but they decide to go ahead with it. And yeah, there are issues, let's just say. <laughs> There's issues, but the thing I really liked about this storyline is the warborn cadets, which all have Shakespearean names like Horatio, Portia, Bertram, Viola, and Titus. I like it because the debate about whether they should be there and what they're there for is between themselves. I mean, we have debates outside of this group also in the book, which we'll get to in a moment. But I like the fact that they were kind of arguing among themselves. It's like, you know, I, we're bred to fight, but then we're here to learn things besides fighting. But it's my nature to fight. So I want to learn more about fighting or I want to learn more about something else and not about fighting. And they're really just trying to figure out what is their place? Is this something they really should be doing? Is this something, I mean, they're not, a po they're not coming in there like, you know, oh, all we do is fight. You know, it's not like you've just hired some Klingons and you, you force them to go into the academy and they're like, oh, we're all about honor. It's not like they're just there wanting to fight. That's not it at all. They're very open to this idea. They want to grow, and but they have to find their place in the world, which now that I'm thinking about it is like Ihora. It's like trying to find your place. And I do love that they're not all one thing. So like you said, you know, some of them are really eager, but some of them really don't want to be there. Like a few of them kind of say like, I don't see the point of this. This doesn't make any sense, especially after they've been there for a little while. Right. Uh, but a lot of them are really enthusiastic and saying we have to represent our planet and you fight for our planet, save our planet, even if it's from ourselves is what one of them says. Uh, fairly early on, which foreshadowed something that I wasn't expecting, but uh, we'll get there. <laughs> so, yeah. And then there's a protester we have who's also a pediatrician, Dr. Ashley Janeth Lau. And she is against this whole thing for obvious reasons, right? Because she thinks that, well, you know, if you're going to bring the war born in, Starfleet may say that we're not going to use them for fighting. Come on, we know that that probably isn't going to always be the case. There's going to be situations where they are they are going to have to fight because Starfleet ends up in battles. It just naturally happens. Yeah, I also found it interesting that the author uses this character to talk a little bit about what Starfleet is and and kind of becoming at this time. Uh, and and I've seen Christopher Bennett mention this on. Trek BBS and stuff that, you know, he really likes the motion picture uniforms and that era and felt that was very Star Trek-y, but moving into Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan and the Monster Maroons, he's like, everything got very militaristic and regimented and it feels way more military than it used to. And he brings that into the story here that, you know, this protester is the leader of a movement and their whole thing is that they feel like Starfleet's getting more military, getting more militaristic. And I loved that we were able to see so much of the civilian side of things in this novel, which is something we don't usually get to see in Star Trek. So I loved this representation of, of the idea of all we ever usually see is 
Starfleet and the officers, but here we get to see the civilians and the population of the Federation and the fact that there's still dissent, there's still individual viewpoints and all of this stuff going on. I really like that. And I like that it's not just this one-sided, oh, I'm against, you know, I'm protesting, that there's dimension to this character. I mean, she's she's very open to having dialogue with Kirk and McCoy about the situation. And she she's open to, you know, giving these guys a chance, but also wanting to make sure that the restraints are there, that they're not being used to eventually fight, that that's not the entire intent of what they're there. And she's holding the Federation. She's holding Starfleet to that, you know, and that's what I liked about it, because you can go into a novel and have a protester and all she's doing is fighting everything that, you know, everybody's saying and wanting to do. And that's not she was being fair. She had people around her at times that were like, hey, we've got to stop this or whatever. And she's like, well, no, let's hear them out. She's very diplomatic. And I like that about the character, which I also like the fact that McCoy wants to set her up with Kirk because <laughs> Kirk's been earthbound. He hasn't had a girlfriend in a while. And he's like, okay, you know, well, maybe I'll ask her out. And instead she's like, uh, no, I'm more interested in McCoy. And I love how the two of them get together. Yeah. Well, I love that because, you know, Kirk's being all suave and stuff and, (laughs) and she's like, you know, um, Jim, can I, can I ask you something, you know, putting, putting this situation aside, can I ask you something of a more personal nature? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can ask. And she's like, is Dr. McCoy seeing anybody? (laughs) And Kirk's like, oh, uh, no. But then, like, I did also appreciate that Kirk was just as pleased to set McCoy up as McCoy was to set Kirk up. Like, that was really sweet. I really liked that. Yeah, I could just picture Kirk smiling through the rest of the novel when he saw the two of them together. (laughs) (laughs) Totally, yeah. Just enjoying it. (laughs) And just McCoy being like, oh, wait, 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 you're interested in me? 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 Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, it was pretty nice. Going into this mystery... I want to ask you something here, because just as we're talking about Ashley Janeth Lau, you know, she is somewhat against, you know, she's protesting. She has some issues with what's going on. And as you mentioned earlier, this commander, Rakathema, was kind of behind this idea and presented it to Starfleet. And he was heard at one point by the cadets as saying that he was, quote, open to broadening the traditional role of the warborn to include combat on behalf of the Federation as a whole. Which now that sounds as if like, okay, he's open to the idea of them actually fighting. And then we find out later that he is found dead and she's the one who's there that finds his dead body. And of course, now the mystery is who killed him and oh, it's got to be her because she has the motive. Mm-hmm. And I and and of course I'm thinking she's not the one who killed him because no, definitely not. <laughs> you know that's that's too easy in this book, right? It's got to be somebody else. But I had no idea. Like, did you try to figure out who it was before you got to the reveal? Yeah, I was. I wasn't necessarily like really trying to figure it out, but I I was thinking at times like, okay, who could it be? And as the investigation goes, it does get narrowed down further and further and further. But, you know, at the time I was like, there was so many people it could have been and, and even get directly called out by various people. So, uh, there's Ashley Janeth Lau, who I was immediately convinced was not in on this at all. Like she did not do it. Uh, there's the cadets themselves, the warborn cadets, there's the Vulcan cadet who's been very outspoken and, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. The cow. Yeah. And, and there's just so many people it could have been. So I wasn't, I wasn't really like trying to figure out definitively who it was, but at various points I was like, well, it could be this person, this person, this person, or this person, and just kind of narrowing it down from there. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I will say I did not guess the killer who it eventually turned out to be. And to my shame a little bit, I was completely surprised by that. And then afterwards I was like, oh, 
that all really fits. Wow. But I didn't, I didn't guess that particular person. Like you, I didn't spend time trying to figure it out, but the Vulcan cadet, Vakal, I kept thinking, okay, it seems like it's going in that direction. But then it also was like, okay, is it making that a little too obvious? Is Christopher Bennett trying to make it obvious to us who the killer is? Or is he trying to pull the wool over our eyes? And to your point, I did not think it was who it was. I, like, it never even occurred to me. So bravo to you, Mr. Bennett. You you got us both on this. And <laughs> I'm relieved to hear you say that because I thought for sure you'd be like, I knew it was them all along. <laughs> and I'd be like, darn it. <laughs> I knew it since page one. <laughs> <laughs> No, I guess we'll say who it is because, again, we're assuming you've either read the book or you don't care to have it spoiled if you haven't read the book. But it was one of the war-born cadets, and it was Horatio, which is kind of the leader of the group. And I'm trying to remember exactly what was his reasoning for that. Well, it really comes from him hearing the the commander say that and him being so against that idea. So the reason for me anyway, that I did not think it was him is he was the happy one. He was the enthusiastic one. He was the one that was like, yeah, we're here at Starfleet. We're going to do our duty. Our job is to save Arcturus. That's our job. Even if we have to save them from ourselves. And it was that line that like gets repeated when you find out he's the killer that, yeah, he is absolutely 100% against them being used as troops for Starfleet. So the minute he heard the commander say that he had to kill him because that's not like, he did not want that going in that way whatsoever, which, you know, in retrospect, I'm like, that all makes sense. That's a great motive. Like it, it all fits. I did not see that coming at all because again, he was the nice, good, happy one. (laughs) Yeah. Which, you know, I don't read a lot of murder mysteries. Maybe I just need to read a lot of them. And maybe it is always the one. It's always the one you least suspect, right? That's what they say. So maybe I just have to think of like who I've not suspected once and say, well, it's probably them. <laughs> well, And the murder wasn't the big storyline of the story anyway. Like this mm-hmm. book isn't a murder mystery. That was just one component of it. It wasn't yeah, like absolutely. the focus, right? I mean, Uhura and the flares, all that, that was more the focus. So it wasn't like it spent a whole lot of time on it. But, you know, they're they're bred to defend Arcturus IV. So, you know, in a sense, I guess that's just in his nature. That was his defense to protect them, themselves as cadets and their planet. Um, yeah, I didn't see it coming, but... Uh, yeah, I'm a little disappointed it was him because I liked him. You know, now he's a murderer. <laughs> yeah, that's <not> <laughs> yeah, too bad. And I mean, you know, maybe that is just a common theme with murder mystery type parts of stories. Like I'm thinking back to the Deep Space Nine episode, Prodigal Daughter, and it was it was Ezri's nice, kind little brother that turned out to be the killer. Like, it's just like, I guess that's a thing. Maybe that's just a thing in in murder mystery (laughs) storylines. I think if I write a murder mystery, I'm going to make it so obvious who the murderer is that everybody will be like, well, that's not who it is. It's too obvious, too obvious. (laughs) And then that's really who it is. (laughs) And then by the end, they'll just be like, well, there's all the evidence and this case has been wrapped up nicely. Let's all go home. And that's just the end of the book. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. That's why I'm not a writer. (laughs) <laughs> so um so let's talk about uhura again because in her past she does find out that she had a friend that she really was working on a project that was related to these flares and this friend later became a lover that she doesn't even remember and it's rajendra sastri and this relationship i i found it interesting he was okay Maybe it's just me, but he was, I mean, I understand he was in love with her. And then when they spoke after she lost her memory, he didn't really believe her. He almost felt that this was just, she was making this excuse as if she's going to break up with him, but they were so in love. Like he was devastated that she would do this to him. 
And when he found out, when he reconnected with her, because she's trying to figure out, you know, what it is that they were doing that could have caused these flares, I felt that he was not understanding enough. Like, I understand that he's lived years with a broken heart and has probably been angry at her. But as soon as he starts to find out that, oh, it's true, she really did lose her memory and he has since moved on and married that I felt like he was still being a little too emotional with her about it. Like, it was like, I don't know. I guess for me, it would be like, I'd still be hurt, but not as hurt. I absolutely agree. I was com- I was really annoyed with this character. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> like, that was just me. <laughs> and and I agree. I Like, I understand, yeah, he was hurt and all this stuff, but there's a really satisfying moment in the book where Uhura finally just like lays into him a little bit Yeah, where, you know, Uhura has been trying to safeguard his feelings and, and, you know, walk on broken glass around him. So I don't know if that's the right phrase, but you know, she's being very walking on eggshells around him. That's the phrase. That's and, it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's being very courteous to his feelings and stuff, but you know, he just one too many times says, you know, you didn't, you didn't try again to reach out to me and make me, you could have made me understand what happened. I, I just thought it was this, but you know, you could have blah, blah, blah. And she's like, why the hell would I reach out to you? Like all my crew members on the enterprise had been completely understanding and all of this. And the first person I reach out to from my past outside of the ship sends this message back to me. No wonder I didn't reach out to you again. And no wonder I didn't reach out to my family after that. You know, not saying it's all because of him, but like, tw- what's the phrase? I can't remember, but like when, you, when you're burned, you don't, you, you're shy, right? Twice burned, once shy, once burned, twice shy, something like that. <laughs> something I can't like remember. That, yeah. <laughs> I'm so bad with, with phrases today, but yeah, she was burned by this. Like, no wonder she retreated back into herself. Like, I, I was not happy with him. Good. I wasn't either. I didn't like him. I was like, come on, dude, get over yourself. Like I was fine at the beginning, but he just carried on for a little too long. You yeah. Know? I, I do like where they end up at the end, mostly for Uhura's sake, but you know, I, I was annoyed by him. I, I am glad they reconnected and I'm glad he came around and, you know, he can admit that he made a mistake and Uhura can say she made a bit of a mistake too, but I don't think it was as on her. She was suffering from a pretty huge trauma. So uh, I, I'm glad where they left it at the end and happy that they're kind of back friends again. But man, I wouldn't trust that guy too much with my feelings, I think. <laughs> so yeah, they were doing something right in their past that caused these flares. And so we come to find out that this is a project that she was working on. Cause when she was a child, she was almost like into like a radio, like almost like ham radio. You know how people who are ham radio operators and stuff. It's like, she was like listening to things in space and she was hearing something that almost sounded like song since, you know, she's very much into musical patterns and things. And when she joined the Academy, she wanted to focus on this research and there was concern that if she does this, it could be a problem or something like, you know, a first contact situation or contact. Difference. I can't remember the total reason for the concern. Do you? Uh, well, it was because she was communicating with beings billions of years in the past. They That's were right, worried it the about past. it changing the future. So the the whole thing was these beings existed in the minutes after the Big Bang. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Yeah, at that period of time, civilizations could rise and fall in seconds, right? Because of the the nature of the of the universe at that time. So they were reaching out to ensure that some part of them survived, right? That they could make contact with somebody on the other side of all of this, and that's what she was listening to. Also, I just have to say, I love that they called it ham subspace radio. Like I love that. That's what it was actually called. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah. But yeah, this was something that had fascinated her all her life and kind of trying to reach out. And like you said, Starfleet had ordered them not to pursue this when they were at the Academy, but afterwards she kept doing this on her own time with, with, uh, Shastri and, they managed contact. They managed two-way contact right before the changeling incident where she lost her, her memories. So 
it, it is pretty tragic. And like the fact that they'd make that, made that breakthrough right at that moment was pretty brutal. And then the fact that, you know, it has all these wide ranging effects afterwards because she'd lost her memory was also quite brutal. <laughs> it is. And, you know, honestly, this is one thing I had a problem with. And I, first of all, Admiral Lance Cartwright is in here who people know from Star Trek four and Star Trek six, you know, he can't be trusted, especially when it comes to the Klingons. He's, he's very much his Cartwright self in here. You know, mm-hmm. he's always, you know, against this and concerned about this and we should have more security and blah, 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 blah. But he even said to her that, you know, in a sense, she's to blame for this because the Academy said that she was not allowed to do this. And she's like, well, I didn't do it through the Academy. I did it through my personal time. And you can't tell me what I can and can't do in my personal time. And this is the one part when I'm like, yeah, but I kind of agree with Cartwright. Like they're saying (laughs) this is an issue. This is a security issue and you're playing with time. And so if we say you shouldn't do this, we mean you shouldn't do it even in your personal time. And, you know, I think she should have got more of a a bigger punishment on this because, you know, she's threatened the lives and people actually did get killed, but she's threatened earth and other planets from, from uh, her actions of what these beings were trying to reach out and what they were causing, not that they were trying to, you know, destroy things, but this is what was happening. This is the results of that. Yeah. Well, and this feeds into one of the major themes, I think, of the novel, which is, of course, communication. Memory is also a big one. But communication, right? All of these problems arise from a lack of communication. The 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 friendship between her and Shastri was destroyed because, you know, he wasn't communicating with her. Her family relationship had to be mended because you know, she was cut off from them and didn't reestablish contact. And same with these plasma beings from billions of years in the past, they sought contact and they got it for a brief moment, but then it was cut off because the experiment stopped because Uhura didn't remember them. And all of these repercussions came out of them trying to reach back out and basically yelling, are you there? (laughs) Is anybody out there? Please answer us. And I find that really interesting that that theme kind of carries through so much of the story. Absolutely. But yeah, with regards to Cartwright as well, I I kind of agreed with him a bit. I loved his characterization in this novel as well, because we know all of this stuff that happens with him in the future, him now, like what he's saying and his actions aren't unreasonable, but you can just see a hint, just (laughs) a hint of what's going to happen a little bit. He's a little bit of a war hawk, a little bit of a, you know, security before anything else kind of thing. And it's, that's a little worrisome. Absolutely. It's exactly, if we had not known where his character lands, we'd probably be like, oh, this Admiral, he was, he's kind of on point. He's right. And we're saying that, but we know where he lands and it's like, "Mm, yeah, I don't always trust what he says. (laughs) Yeah. But I love what you're saying about communication, Um, because that really is the ultimate theme of this book, is communication. And what better character to use for communication, right, is Uhura. Absolutely. (laughs) So that's excellent. Um, You know, are there other things that we want to talk about? Because I know you had some other things that you liked about this. Yeah, and and I mean, I mentioned already about seeing the civilian side of the Federation, but there's a quote that I really liked that I think, you know, novels, of course, are written for the time they're written in. This is set in the future, but it's for us to hear. And I love that we see the civilian side of things, and I love what Christopher Bennett has to say about the role of protest in a free and open society. So at one point, uh, Dr. Janeth Lau says, it's easy for people to lower their guard and trust their leaders to take care of the decisions for them. But leaders make mistakes and people need to be aware of them. Seeing protesters get arrested when we stand up for what should be basic Federation values, it's an effective way to get the public to notice when the authorities lose their way. And I just, I love that. Like, yes, protest, get out in the streets. You see something that needs changing, go be the change you want to see in the world. (laughs) I can see you tweeting this out. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And kind of in a similar vein, speaking of, you know, going out there and making the changes, there's, there's one little tiny bit of the novel that I really liked because, so I, I have a lot of friends that believe that, you know, the, the world as it is and, and, you know, the countries we live in the U S and, and Canada, they're not on a good road and things need to change and they need to change immediately and drastically. So I, you know, I have friends that are very revolutionary, let's say, you know, but I, I think it's important. And this was a lesson in Star Trek Picard as well to not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Right. So, you know, we can, we, some people see revolution and immediately immediate change is the only way forward, but there is value in incremental change in the right direction as an important step along the way. So there was another quote that from the novel that I loved and I had, I did in my ebook here, progress often comes in small steps instead of rejecting the next step because it isn't large enough. We should take it, then use it as a foundation to climb up to the next step and the next building momentum as we go. So yeah, like I see politicians saying like, we want to do this to help out middle-class families or lower-class families and all this stuff. And people say, well, that's not enough. You need to do this, 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 and this as well. Well, I agree, but let's start with this and keep going. You know, don't shoot this idea down because it's not big enough yet. You know, I don't know. Anyway. (laughs) No, I agree with you there. It's, you know change isn't easy if you, if you're trying to make change i mean yeah you want it to all happen at once but it takes each step i mean it, just look at history of how things have changed it, it's not immediate it takes time and it, you take one step at a time and every little change can lead to the next change and if you add all the little changes up it is a big change mm-hmm. so Uh, Yeah, I like that too. Because the thing is, if you expect everything to change immediately, if you're trying to expect one large change, more than likely that's not going to happen. And one of two things are going to happen. It doesn't happen or it happens and it regresses back because it was too quick for that big change to occur. And if it doesn't happen or regresses back to the way it was before, then you're going to get disappointed and you might give up. So just that slow momentum, that slow, but it's like me trying to lose weight right now. I take it one day at a time. I'm not going to lose 40 pounds in one day. (laughs) Yeah. You know, now don't get me wrong. There are some things out there that, you know, need to change right away. And like, yeah, that needs to change. Obviously, you know, something really bad that needs to change. So for people listening out there, if there's something on your mind that you're thinking, well, Dan's wrong about that. This obviously needs to change right now. Yeah. I mean, those things you're absolutely right. Yeah. Those things, (laughs) whatever those things are. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever those things are that you're going to get mad at me and, and tweet to me about. Yeah. That's what I mean. Those, those need to change right away. You're absolutely right. What does it mean? Exact change. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh not that kind of change um okay on a lighter note one thing there's a little thing in here i really liked where christopher bennett has uhura say uh something about her academy days and she's trying to find out the people she knew at the academy and maybe she can find out some information from them and there was this you know, she names certain people. And then there was this Orion girl that she was like roommates with or something. She doesn't know her name. I no can't one remember her. her name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I did look at his annotations that, yeah, that is a call back to Star Trek 09 that maybe the roommate she had in that movie, she may, you know, maybe this Orion girl is the same one. Maybe it's not, but you know, it could be. Oh, and then also Hora doesn't always like to reveal her first name, which also comes from that movie. Yeah. And one brief little line I noticed that, you know, when she was, I think she was talking to the Commodore, the retired Commodore. And she said, do you recognize me from the Academy days? I had long straight hair back then though. Yes. And I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Also looked a little bit like Zoe Saldana. I don't know if, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I I remember seeing that too because then I want of course I always do this when I read novels. I went back and watched The Changeling again and I was looking mm, at I was going to ask if you did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at her I'm like, 
when she was in the academy, she had straight hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to picture Nichelle Nichols with straight hair when she was younger. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, the other thing I liked uh, is Demora Sulu having a little bit of her in there and just keeping up that whole idea that Hikaru Sulu is watching her because her mother passed away and he didn't know about her birth, blah, blah, blah. We've had that in previous novels and things, but uh, just keeping up with that and uh, also seeing Sulu working at the Academy. That's the other thing I like is I don't like it when people just assume that after their second five year mission on the Enterprise, everyone went to teach at the Academy and they were doing that while Chekhov was out on the ship as a first officer. It's like, I like to think, no, they're, they're not just teaching, they're involved in other things. They're doing other projects, they're doing other missions, and that comes across in this book. I really liked, we didn't talk much about him, but I really liked Sulu in this novel. I loved his kind of mentor role with Portia when they were flying, and yeah. and I liked a lot of what he said to her, and I liked that he kind of like, was that the best thing to say? I don't know, I don't want to inspire her to do something rash, which of course is a little bit foreshadowing to her being a suspect in the in the murder later. But I, I did like those connections. And speaking as someone who has spent much of my life being a teacher, I appreciated that, that, you know, there are those students that you form that bond with, that they look up to you for that advice. And, and that moment felt very real to me. Yeah, during the murder investigation, it really seemed like he was really very supportive of them and really valued them and liked them. And, you know, another thing, we didn't really talk that much about the other cadets. We talked about the Cal, the Vulcan. I don't know if I have a whole lot to say about the other cadets, but it was just nice to see their interaction with the Warborn cadets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they would get along, but they'd have their debates too. Yeah, I, I liked that... I think I said earlier too, the Warborn cadets weren't all just one monolithic group. Like they all had their own kind of views and viewpoints and stuff. And seeing those debates carry out, not just among them, but among the other cadets as well. I, I found that really interesting. So what are your final thoughts on this book? So final thoughts. I really enjoyed this novel. I, I, like I said, I read most of it in one day. I was really carried along by the story there's there's this tendency of Christopher L. Bennett's to have these like big science fiction mysteries and stuff. And like I said before, though, to have it on a personal level as well, kind of hinging on interpersonal relationships between characters. And I really appreciate that because like you said earlier, I'm really into the more personal stories and the more intimate kind of details about people's lives and how they react to one another and how they interact with each other that to me you know the the human adventure is just beginning right it's it's star trek's a story about the future with aliens and fantastical stuff but it's about us it's about humans and how we relate to each other so i really enjoyed this novel even the plot heavy bits like the murder mystery i was really into i was really into the mystery about the vacuum flares and just seeing a glimpse of this era that we don't usually get to see a lot of the Reliant. I thought that was great. Having that being a main ship. Also, I love that the Soyuz class got a little bit of love here. We have the Soyuz class USS Amazon at one point and the myriad of references that Christopher Bennett does. Uh, we had a reference to the L five colonies, the Vanguard colony from the lost era, the sundered, uh, that we covered back in Positively Trek 87. You know, uh, something we've read recently. I liked that. I just, I love his books and this one was no exception. So I would have to give it, I think, five out of five Verderon fields that are protecting Earth and the Enterprise from the vacuum flares. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about those, but yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Yeah, this this book was really good. Yeah, Christopher L. Bennett doesn't disappoint. Yeah, I'm 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 really picking up on the different styles of our authors, and the more we get to know them, and I mean, I think they're all great. And but yeah, Christopher L. Bennett just has a a great knowledge of little minutia things in Star Trek that he likes to just kind of drop in and. If you're people like us that have read so much and seen so many of the episodes, you pick up on a lot of it and maybe not even all of it. And, 
you know, but uh, it, those things are fun. But focusing on the character of Uhura and her losing her memory and it's revealed that, yeah, it's stuck. I mean, she didn't get her memory back later like I assumed in the episodes. Well, she just must have, like, her memory just must have come back at some point. No, it's just, it's been gone and it's, she's had no connections with people in her past and and her dealing with her family and this friend and lover that she worked with this project with and her putting those pieces together and, and working with them to reestablish a new relationship makes me even want to see a sequel to see how things are going in her life with those relationships and the mystery of the flares uh, and the warborn and the cadets and this period of time in the Federation. I mean, it's, it's a changing time. And, and like you said, it's, you can see it in the uniform. So yeah, overall, I really enjoyed the novel. I'm not going to give it a full like five out of five necessarily. It's going to be really close, but probably because that one dude just kind of annoyed me. You know, he needs to get <laughs> over her, but <laughs> I'm going to give this one nine out of 10 ships that did not get a flare that flared up in their ship and destroyed them. Only one did. Nice. If that That's makes good. any sense. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> That's not my best rating scale thing, but you know, whatever. <laughs> I almost said nine out of ten hairstyles that Uhura had as a cadet. <laughs> now I wish I did say that. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> you're you're the one editing. You can still say that. <laughs> it's staying in there. <laughs> anyway, okay, yeah, really great book. Uh, if you haven't read it, well, we just spoiled it all for you, but go ahead and read it anyway. We'd love to hear your thoughts, though. So let us know. Follow us on Twitter at Positively Trek. Let us know your thoughts through Twitter or go into our discussion group on Facebook. We'll let you in if you're not a member of that. And let us know your thoughts about this novel. You can also email us, PositivelyTrek at gmail.com. And Dan, where can people find you online if they want to talk about the novel with you? On Twitter at Kurtrats, on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, and my website at Treklet.com. And I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And then, you know, whatever, I'm on Facebook too. You can find me on there. And that's about it. I'm not going to go into where else you can find me because I don't get out much because of COVID. But that's changing now. So I get out a little more. I actually have been eating at restaurants a few more times. So. Wow. While That's I'm on exciting. a diet. <laughs> like we went to a Mexican restaurant and everybody gets all of this food and I just had two tacos. Oh. But they were good. I, they were they, good I bet you they were good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to stay positive, which we want everyone else here to do. And also, you know, hey, join our Patreon group and uh, be a patron. A dollar, whatever, you know. And uh, you get to hear little special outtakes that we do. Uh, we have a recent one up there that Dan just put up. So check it out. So anyway, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you next time. And remember to stay positive. Stay positive.